everyone. Welcome to our Good Friday service. Uh, this is a different service than our normal kind of uplifting light service on a Sunday. On, on Good Friday, um, it's more subdued. Uh, we're dealing with uh, the death of our Savior. And tonight we're going to look into the seven words that Jesus spoke while he was on the cross. And here's Jesus going to the last basic hours of his, of his life here on earth. And he's sharing some incredibly uh, intimate um, aspects of his life and his ministry and who he is. And it's kind of a more intimate setting. And uh, a lot of folks, uh, when God invites us into a little bit more of an intimate relationship with him, we kind of shy away from it and push back. Uh, it's kind of scary to get that personal. And my prayer tonight is, as we go through the words uh, that Jesus spoke at the cross, that it will take us a step closer uh, to maybe understanding uh, the heart of the gospel and the heart of our God. So I'd like to just pray for us tonight. Um, and just ask that God uh, gives us the courage to enter into his presence in a new way tonight. So let's pray. Lord, thank you for all that you've done for us. Thank you that we have the freedom to celebrate Good Friday here. Um, I just ask, Lord God, as we're here, uh, and as you draw us into your presence, uh, that we willingly, willingly will take a step closer to you as we see what you did for us at the cross. I just ask, Lord God, that that will begin to echo in our being, that you will open up our hearts and our minds, that we can understand even to a greater extent what you've done for us. So bless tonight, Lord God, bless our service and let us just meet with you in a very special way. In Christ's name, amen. Jessica.
fingertips Hidden in the garden I denied you with my very lips Then I bow down to my knees With a hammer in my head You look at me to death with him. When they came to the place that is called the skull, they crucified Jesus there with the criminals, one on the right and one on his left. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they cast lots to divide his clothing, and the people stood by watching. But the leaders scoffed at him, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself if he's a Messiah of God, his chosen one. The soldiers also mocked him, coming up and offering him sour wine and saying, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. But there was also an inscription over him, This is the king of the Jews. The Roman soldiers placed an inscription reading, King of the Jews, above Christ's head. This sign was meant as a joke to defame Jesus and taunt the onlooking Jews. Little did they know the truth that was spoken through their jest. In addition, they placed a reed in his hand and a crown of thorns on his head and mockingly bowed before him. At this time, Jesus prayed to the Father, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Only God could be so understanding while being so misunderstood and so forgiving under such cruel treatment. Our strength to forgive rather than to condemn and to bless rather than to curse our offenders only comes as we experience God's forgiveness. This is why we cry out in unison, Lord, teach us to live. Who am I that the highest king would welcome me? I was lost, but he brought me.
criminals who were hanged railed again at him, saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we are receiving the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. And he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he said to him, truly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Here we see our Savior executed between two common everyday criminals. So common, in fact, that no name is given to either of them in scripture. To add insult to injury, one of the thieves used his last words to berate Jesus. Ironically, the other thief chose to use his last words to beg Jesus to be with him in his, in his time of need. Here we have two dying men with two totally different responses. As Christians, this helps us understand that our God is always present with us, whether we want him there or not. In our times of joy, sorrow, and even death, God is there. We don't need to be famous or renowned because we, our God even attends the executions of nameless thieves. We just need to be receptive to his pr presence and his words. And if we are, he will remind us by saying, Truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. This is why we declare in unison, Lord, teach us so to die.
19, 23 through 27. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them into four parts, one for each soldier. They also took his tunic. Now the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from the top. So they said to one another, let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to see who will get it. This was to fulfill what the scripture says, they divided my garments among themselves, and for my clothing they cast lots. And that is what the soldiers did. Meanwhile, standing near the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved, Standing beside her, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his own home. Jesus is hanging on a cross. In this time of incredible cruelty and pain, Jesus casts his attention away from himself and on those most dear to him, looking at his earthly mother who bore him and protected him, and the disciple whom he loved. In this moment of blinding pain and destitution, Jesus, with nothing to give his mother but his love and support, says, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his own home. This world is full of examples of philanthropic endeavors, and many of them amazing. But there's nothing more precious we can give to another human than our love. This is why we declare, Lord, teach us so to give.
Matthew 27, 45 through 46. Now from the sixth hour there was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lima sabachthani. That is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Darkness covers Jesus in the last moments of his earthly life. Very different from the time on the Mount of Transfiguration where he was transfigured and his face shined like the sun. Here he experiences darkness and abandonment. There is no Moses and Elijah to speak to him. He is alone in the dark without even God to comfort him. It's at this time of loneliness, abandonment, and despair that he cries out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus suffered God's abandonment, so we will never have to. Because of what Jesus experienced, we know that our Heavenly Father will never leave us or forsake us. That is why we declare, Lord, teach us so to pray.
29. After this, Jesus, knowing that all was now finished, said to fulfill the scripture, I thirst. A bowl full of vinegar stood there, so they put a sponge full of the wine on a branch of hyssop and held it to his mouth. Here Jesus' humanity has run its course. His body is failing under the brutality of the beatings and the violence of the cross. This is no Superman who is void of pain and human suffering. This is God becoming human and experiencing bodily pain and anguish. As his body begins to succumb to human frailty, he utters one small phrase, I thirst. His request and thirst is met with vinegar. How cruel, how insensitive to give a dying man who requests something to drink, vinegar. This is what our God went through for us. So when we bruise, bleed, thirst, and beg for mercy, we know we have a God who's not detached from our plight. We know that he is not unfamiliar with our suffering and has a purpose for all that we go through in this life. This is why we say, Lord, teach us so to be.
John 19:30a. When Jesus had received the vinegar, he said, "It is finished." Jesus in his death does not offer up a weary sigh or some litany of crazy ramblings, but rather one word, tetelestai. This word is similar to a shout of joy from one who just completed a long, difficult task. Today we would say, thank God that's over, or done, signifying something is complete and something new is beginning. This is why we say, Lord, teach us so to do. Amen. I remember in the 80s, uh, HBO came to northern New Jersey where I was living at the time, and here we had all these different kinds of movies to watch and things like that. And this one movie came on, and it was uh, a movie about uh, Joe Kennedy Jr. And Joe Kennedy Jr. was, was in the uh, Army Air Corps at the time. He was a flyer. <clears throat> and he was getting involved with uh, transporting one of the uh, possible transport of one of the atom bombs. And he was going through all different kinds of, of, of service. And he would reflect back to what his father, Joe Sr., would tell him. And Joe Sr. was bent on having one of his kids be the President of the United States. And he would tell his kids um, as, at a young age, you need to have money, you need to have an Ivy League uh, education, and you need to serve in the military with distinction. Now, if you don't know the story of Joe uh, Jr., he did the first two and was in the process of doing the third, serving with distinction, when his plane crashed and he died and was one of the you know, deaths that the Kennedy family uh, suffered in their lineage. And if I was to ask you a question and say, what would it take to be the most famous, the most influential, human who has ever lived on the planet, you would probably give me something along the line of what Joe Kennedy said to his son. You need to have money, you need to get a great education, and you need to dis set yourself, be an outlier of some kind. And if you were to go to ask all the most brilliant and wisdom, you know, people of, of renown in the world, how do you become the most influential human who has ever walked on the face of the earth, you would get a litany of these things. Oh, you have to come from a blue blood line of these people. Oh, you have to have money behind you. You need to, you know, cure cancer. You need to go do this big event. Oh, you need to do this. What you would never, ever tell me is you need to be born in obscurity, in the middle of nowhere, in this backwater place that it, it, it's looked on with kind of like, ugh. And, and to parents who have no money, no influence, no education. And then what you need to do with your life is never, ever be formally educated. Don't get involved in politics. Don't get involved in power. Don't ever write a book. Don't ever build something and leave it behind. And definitely, you would tell me, you should probably live to your, like, older. Don't get executed openly and shamed in your 30s. But that's exactly what we're talking about tonight, is the most influential, most famous person who's ever walked on planet Earth, grew up in total obscurity, in the middle of nowhere, a backwater, to parents who were poor, never was formally educated, never got involved in politics, never invented anything, never wrote anything down, and was publicly shamed and executed in his 30s. But yet, he influences more lives and is still to this very day the most known individual who's ever walked on planet Earth. How can, how can that be? How can that be? If we were going to do that, we would do an exact opposite of the way Jesus did it. You go to an ivy, you have lots of money, and you go cure cancer or something like that. Why is that? Why are we celebrating this tonight? It's because God's kingdom is the exact opposite or works the exact opposite than our kingdom. 
Here's a verse in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. I'm going to read right through to, from 20 to 25. It says, where is the one who is wise? I just ask you a question about how do you do something? Wise people would tell us a certain way. And he says, where's the scribe? Where's the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom. It pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jew and folly to the Gentile. But to those who are called, both Jew and Greek, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. And what God says here is my world or my kingdom, the way I do things, very different than the way you do it. Matter of fact, it's the exact opposite of the way you do it. Matter of fact, it's totally counterintuitive to the way you do things. And by the way, even the way most churches think things should be done. How do you affect the world? Get executed in your 30s in the middle of nowhere? What? How do you become the most famous person? Be born in a backwater? Go... You can never do that. But in God's kingdom, he does that. And he continues to do that. This is what John Calvin wrote. It's kind of a long quote. Don't normally read these long kind of quotes, but this one's pretty good. It's John Calvin, okay? It says, it follows that every good thing we could think or desire is to be found in the same Jesus Christ alone. For he humbled himself to exalt us. He made himself a servant to set us free. He became poor to enrich us. He was sold to buy us back, captive to deliver us, condemned to absolve us. Righteousness marred that we may be made fair. He died for our life. This he did in such a way that by him hardness is softened, wrath is appeased, darkness turned into light, fear reassured, despisal despised, debt canceled, labor lightened, sadness made merry, misfortune made fortune, difficulty easy, disorder ordered, division united, rebellion subjected, intimidation intimidated. Ambush uncovered, assault assailed, force forced backed, combat combated, war warred against, vengeance avenged, torment tormented, damnation damned, the abyss sunk into the abyss, hell transfixed, death dead, mortality made immoral, in short, mercy has swallowed up all misery and kindness all misfortune. God does everything backwards and upside down from the way we do things. Jesus came from heaven to earth so we might go from earth to heaven. Jesus was made sin so that we could be made righteous. Jesus, Jesus died that we might live. How do we partake of this? How do we embrace this? Is it just belief? Everybody, oh, just believe. But we hear in this verse that Jesus wasn't a philosopher. He had a philosophy, but he wasn't just a philosopher. And one thing you don't see is poor people in parts of the world discussing Plato, but you see them discussing Jesus. Well, was just Jesus then some religious leader that we partake of it by in, you know, imitating him? God, no. If that is your version of the Bible, that it's your textbook for your life, you're going to have those reoccurring dreams that Mark Twain had, that this big Bible's on your chest and it's crushing you. 
Jesus' life wasn't there just for us to imitate. Jesus wasn't a religious leader who said, okay, folks, get it straight, pull up your bootstraps and act like me. That's not what Jesus said. Get your life together and act like me. No, he said, I lived a life that you couldn't live. So how do we partake of it? How do we really embrace this? So we do something that this world would tell us never, ever to do. So we go and we confess and we admit our weaknesses. We get honest. We talk to God like we talk to ourselves when we lay, like that, 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 that moment where we lay down at night before we fall asleep. And who we really are comes out. And what we really fear is clawing at us. We go to God and we admit our weaknesses. And then we talk to him about our shame. Because we all know we don't measure up. It's not just about believing. It's not just about acting. It's about admitting our weaknesses and embracing our shame. It's admitting we're weak. Last week I was with my folks. My folks are getting older, failing in health, and my, my dad, especially, especially through COVID, he hasn't been out of the house in probably over a year. I took him to the park with my mom and had some coffee and bagels and just drove around. He can't even walk now. So their house is a tri-level home. And on the first floor where, um, he, where he's currently living is you know a TV room and there's a uh, shower and bath and there's a study that I turned into a kitchen for him so they can kind of function in this little area and there's a bedroom off of the TV room so it's like an apartment but if you go up to the second area is where their dining room and their kitchen and and there's this big living room there and it's really nice it's got windows all over the place the vaulted ceiling with skylights it's really bright where he is right now is kind of it faces the back of the house there's a pool and stuff but it's just not really bright you know and every time I go there I'm like this is the darkest room in the house why don't you move up to the second floor but he can't get up the stairs so being an Italian guy, I said, hey, why don't you get one of those lifts like Libby Soprano? You know, you can get on there and yell at me when you go up and down the stairs like Libby did to Tony, you know, you're a rotten son or something. And so he's like, ah, and he says, you know, those things are expensive. But I'm like, yeah, Dad, you're stuck down here in this dungeon, you know. Why don't you get up to the second floor? Okay, it's going to be funny. We'll laugh at you as you go up down the stairs and... Maybe I can hotwire it. I used to be an electrician. Maybe I can make it go a little faster for you or something. Make it a ride. You know, we'll give you a parachute or something. He's like, ah, oh, it's too expensive. Well, I'm talking to home care, and someone asked a question. Was your dad a veteran? I'm like, you know, I, he was in the service, but he never went to war. Is he? Yeah, he's a veteran. I'm like, oh, my goodness. He said, you get all these benefits. I'm like, really? And they're going through them. And he's like, what's his home like? I'm like, well... He can't get to the second floor, you know. He can't get up to the kitchen area. He's like, we'll put one of those lifts in. So I'm like, cool. So I go to my dad. I'm like, hey, expense is taken care of. You got a gift. He's like, what? I'm like, you got a gift. You want to go up there? All you got to do is say, I want to go to the second floor. The BL come and put one in for you. And he goes, I just started physical therapy, and I kind of try to get up there on my own. And that's good. I'm like, that's fair. That's good. Okay, we'll get you up there. But just want to let you know, there's a lift that'll get you up there. There's no expense to it. It's a gift from the VA to you. You just got to ask They'll come in and install it. Most of us say, like my dad, I'd rather do it on my own. And I'm not shaming my dad for wanting to try to get back into shape, and you know, he's 85 and wants to do No, I'm not, I'm not saying that. But many of us, when it comes down to the gift of salvation, a lot of us say, No, I'd rather do it on my own. And if that's you, Jesus is just an example. He's just your Lord, going to tell you what to do thing is, we can't divorce the idea of Jesus being our Savior and Lord. If we do, our faith goes haywire. 
the way we embrace this upside down world, the way we embrace the kingdom of God is admitting we need help to get up there. Our faith is the only faith. It is the only ethic, the only religion, the only philosophy that is not telling us that we need to make ourselves better to meet God, that we're climbing up this mountain to meet God on top of the mountain. Our faith is the only faith where God comes down the mountain to us. Every other one is telling you, you got to do A, B, C, D, you need to make God happy. Ours says God's happy, you don't have to do anything. You just got to accept the gift that he's given you. And when you love him, you obey him. When you love him, you'll serve him. When you love him, you'll respond to him with appreciation and gratitude instead of white-knuckling it down. Your faith will go from a have-to to a get-to if you understand what God did for you. He's giving you the gift. All you have to do is take it. Admit you're weak and offer him your shame. Good Friday, as tragic as it was, as scary as it was for the disciples, as we look at it, we realize that we are part of a faith that is so new, so unique, so different than any other religion out there. That we're part of a faith a gift that God gave us. Good Friday, when we look at it, we should thank God for what he did for us. By becoming killable, he gave us life. By becoming weak, he makes us strong. By becoming sin, he makes us holy. As we transition into another word, and then communion. Let me just pray for us as we celebrate this Good Friday and as we go into Easter Sunday and just ask God to, to open up uh, the gospel to us in a new way. So let's pray. Lord, what an amazing God we serve. Thank you for the privilege of being offered this incredible gift that you've given us. Thank you for the blessing of the gospel in this relationship that's open between us and you. Lord, as we celebrate Good Friday and as we continue to just go over what you've done for us, open up our hearts and our minds to you. Let us be willing to admit that we need your help, that we're weak. Let us offer you our shame to receive the gift of salvation. I pray that in Christ's name. Amen. Sure. Luke 23, 44 through 46. It was now about the sixth hour, and there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour, while the sun's light failed, and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Then Jesus, crying with a loud voice, said, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. And having said this, he breathed his last. Jesus, after all he has gone through, begins to speak his last words on earth. He chooses not to quote from some profound text from ancient scripture or reference some brilliant maxim or proverb but finds it fitting to recite a prayer taught to every Hebrew child from infancy. Similar to our Western prayer, now I lay me down to sleep. Jesus says, Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit. It's at these times when everything is seemingly going mad and we feel like the world is caving in on us that we need to get down to the brass tacks of our faith and respond to God like a child does to a loving parent. It's at these times that we must trust and rest in the hands of our loving Father. This is why we say, Lord, teach us so to trust, so to pray, and so to die. Amen.
Amen. The invitation goes out to you who truly and earnestly repent of your sins, who live in love and peace with your neighbor, and who intend to lead a new life following the commandments of God. In walking in his holy ways, you are invited to draw near by faith and take this holy sacrament to your comfort and humbly coming before your God and make your honest confession to him. This evening, we'll recite the Lord's Prayer together. We'll use the terms debts and debtors. <clears throat> if you're not familiar with the Lord's Prayer, I'd encourage you just to listen along. And then at the end, affirm or say, I agree by saying, Amen. The Lord's Prayer says, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who gave in love your only Son, Jesus Christ, to suffer death upon the cross for our redemption, who by his sacrifice offered once for all, did provide a full, perfect, and sufficient atonement for the sins of the whole world, we come now to your table in obedience to your Son, Jesus Christ, who in his holy gospel commanded us to continue a perpetual memory of his precious death until he come again. Hear us, O merciful, merciful Father, we humbly ask, and grant that we, receiving this bread and this cup, as he commanded in the memory and the passion of his death, may partake of his most blessed body and blood. In the night when Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In like manner, we'll take the bread and we'll break it, symbolizing the body of Christ, which was broken for us. In like manner, after supper, he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of this, all of you. For this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for you and for many, for the remission of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Amen. At this time, I'd invite you to take your packet of elements here. Let's take the wafer out, and we'll take together in unison. The body of Christ which is broken for us, let's take together in unison. I invite you to take the top off of the lower part of the elements. Let's take together in unison. Let's pray. Lord Jesus Christ, thank you for all that you've done for us at the cross. Thank you for the power of the cross in our lives. I just ask, Lord God, that we've embraced and taken this sacrament, that your grace will flow into our being in a newfound way. Open up our hearts, our minds, our ears to your word and your grace. I pray that in Christ's name. Amen. Jessica. Let us sing together. Amazing
let's close in a word of prayer. Lord Jesus, thank you. Thank you for all that you've done for us at the cross. Thank you that we know that we get to look forward to resurrection day. So Lord, now as we go our way, let us go knowing that we've celebrated what you did for us through all the pain and anguish that you suffered for us. Let us know, Lord God, that we can go forth cleansed by your blood. We can go forth looking forward to eternal life because of what you've done for us. So be with us now as we go. Let your grace rest upon us. Let your joy fill us. We pray this in Christ's name. And everyone said, Amen. 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 Thanks for coming out. God bless you. You're dismissed. Thank you.